Have you ever heard of the Steamboat Ladies? No one ever imagined that they would arrive in such numbers. I think their story is untold. Like, it's not yeah. like... It's not known. Like, we were shocked when we heard it, because yeah. we were like, no, like, that's, that's a story. Like, but it, was, it was real. It is a real story, a hidden part of history. These are the Mercy Girls, as they call themselves. Six-year students from Mercy Secondary School in Shakur, Dublin 8. Alessandra Diaz. Uh, I'm Katie Brown. Um, I'm Jodie White. Um, I'm Joyce Sarah Gibbon. I'm Kim Fallon. I'm Nave McGurk. These girls know the story of the Steamboat Ladies, and it has inspired them. And before I tell you the story, let me set the scene. We are in Trinity between 1904 to 1907, the Edwardian era. All of Ireland is still under British rule. Education in Ireland for the majority is limited to primary school. And educating women was not considered important. Remember, we're still 11 years away from women getting the vote. Trinity College Dublin, which was founded by Queen Elizabeth I in 1592, only opened its doors to women in 1904, after decades of campaigning. Emeritus Fellow of Trinity, Susan Parks, is a historian of education, and she wrote a book on the history of women in Trinity, which has the fabulous title, A Danger to the Men. The title really comes from the 1895 statement that having women in the college was a danger to the men and that they were not prepared to take that risk. Now, there was a very big move in 1895 when uh, the college was 300 years old. The person who really worked most hard for Trinity was Alice Oldham, who kicked the door down and she led the campaign to try and get Trinity to open its doors. And the women got together a petition of about 10,000 signatures, huge scroll, to petition the board of Trinity to allow women to enter the college. And the co- college hummed and hawed and hummed and hawed and put it off and eventually asked for three men to come and make the women's case. They wouldn't have the women, but the men could come and make the case. And in the end, they refused. The women did not give up. The campaign continued and a lot of the younger men at Trinity supported it. Slowly, things began to change, and women were starting to be seen as having co-educational rights. And so, ten years on makes a big difference. Um, The old provost, Salmon, who was the old provost, who said no woman, plus his dead body, would women enter this university. Uh, He died in January 1904, and they were in by March. He got his wish! (laughs) Uh, his statue is in front square. I'd always tell the girls, I said, go bow to him, please. And tell him you're here. <laughs> the words of former provost George Salmon, over my dead body will women enter this college, are still infamous in Trinity. And it is customary for women students to salute the statue of Provost Salmon. And every Women's Day, they duly cover it in a black bag as protest. But back to 1904. Trinity was not the first college to allow women students. Trinity has a unique connection to Cambridge and Oxford, and they had already admitted women. What they did was set up women's colleges. In Oxford, there was Somerville and Lady Margaret Hall, and in Cambridge, Girton and Newnham. <clears throat> Oxford and Cambridge pioneered the idea of women's colleges, which were uh, really founded to educate women se- separately, and had, but encouraged them in the academic excellence and they were really powerhouses of young women who were really in very fine intellectuals. Fine intellectuals, but still not regarded as equal to men. For even though women could study in Oxford and Cambridge, they were not awarded their formal degrees. Anyone who'd been to Girton or Newnham or Somerville was, was a very fine degree, but no degree. So just to be clear, they were allowed sit their degree, they were allowed to submit their papers, they were allowed to go to the lectures. That's right. All of that. Yes. But And so they they got their degree, they were told you passed it, but they weren't given the formality of it. That's Is that right. the differentiation? That's the differentiation, yes. Uh, Oxford and Cambridge wouldn't give them their degrees uh, because they would have had power within the university, a quite considerable power, you see, in governing the university. When Trinity admitted women, they did not make that particular differentiation. They did make others, though, and I'll come back to that later. 
a consequence of Trinity's decision in 1904 to award women full degrees was something that no one could have imagined. Under a very old link between Oxford, Cambridge and Dublin, as the three ancient oldest universities, they had this arrangement that you could do your exams in one and get your degree from the other. The, 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 the scheme they used was called Ade Undum Gradum. This scheme was known to a few people, and in particular, a Mr Bennett. A Mr Bennett in Belfast, who had a daughter who had just been and graduated at Cambridge, wrote to Trinity and said, my daughter was not able to come to your university, but now you're admitting women. She has completed her exams in Cambridge. Would you give her a degree? So they said, oh, well, under the old rule of ade undum gradum, we could. So we will. We will agree. So Trinity then said, well, we've opened our doors to women now in 1904. So for three years, we will give Dublin University degrees to women from the Oxford and Cambridge colleges who have successfully completed their degree examinations. So they didn't need to do any study in Dublin. They could just come, fill up the form and come and get the degree and go away. And I think they thought a few Irish girls who hadn't been able to go to Trinity, would apply. In the end, 700 applied. So what was supposed to be a handful of women coming through Trinity doors turned out to be a troop of 700 women. Can you imagine what impact that had at the time? So they were overwhelmed by all these young women, and not so young, coming over and doing this. And it turned into quite a big episode, really. Now, it was very good for Trinity women, because what they saw was, they saw these women, academic women, proudly wearing their gowns and their hoods, and everything, all professional, largely professional women, and they said, that is what women graduates can do. Why did they come? They came because they wanted professionally to be able to wear a gown and a hood and to be able to put BA or MA after their name. Most of them only came for one night. They would have been already in their 50s, some of them. They would have been lecturers. They were working in school teaching or in public life. And so they took one day off. They came on the, on the ferry overnight and stayed one night in Dublin, got their degree the next day and went back the following night. And that's how they got nicknamed the Steamboat Ladies. Because you can imagine an invasion of the, all these women into Trinity. They came and they went. And they're always known then, both both here and in Oxford and Cambridge, as the steamboat ladies. But isn't that an amazing power that they come? Like, could you imagine, as a young girl? Like, yes. Um, like when we heard about we were like, did they actually have to do that? But this was a big thing that these women came over and they had to come over all the way from Oxford to get their degrees. Yeah, like, but if you look at history, it's not that long. It's like yesterday in history. The Mercy Girls found out about the steamboat ladies well before me. They came across them while researching a project they wanted to do. It took us a week to kind of find the steamboat ladies. But, and it's not easy, like, you look it up, but you have to, like, go in through to a few things yeah. to actually find, find it. Story. Yeah. But, like, we're in all girls' school. You'd think it'd be, different, like, something we'd know because, I don't know, maybe, just, like, just girl stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you learn about girl empowerment, so why didn't we learn about sure. steamboat yeah, ladies? Sure here as, like, an inspirational story. Yeah. And when they did find out about them, they decided to retrace their journey from Oxford. And they did that as part of College for Every Student, or CFES. This is a non-profit organisation that works in partnership with Trinity and whose aim is to create and maintain a college-going culture in schools in socially and economically disadvantaged areas. It kind of gave us more of a voice, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they were like, college is for everyone. Like You can go, it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what you want to do. You can go to college. I think because we were doing CFE as well, teachers kind of took us more seriously and listened to us more. And so we do like leadership projects every year. So for their CFES project in 2017, they raised the funds themselves to retrace the journey of the Oxford Steamboat Ladies. Because like we were like, we're like going over there and they had to come over here to so get we degrees. Were, like, and, yeah, we were continuing their journey. This is the journey of the Steamboat Ladies, who they were, and why their story is still relevant today. But when I went to Cambridge, I found in Cambridge, in the library at Newnham, one of the students, she became a librarian, had kept all the tickets and dockets of her Dublin visit. 
And uh, I'm going to show them to you too. Miss Hingston, who came to get her degree in 1905. That's the bill for the Hotel Metropole, where she stayed the night, £1.14 shillings and sixpence. Now, they were encouraged to stay at a temperance hotel, if that was suitable, but she stayed at the Metropole. What's a temperance? Temperance hotel would be one where there was no drink. And you see, young women travelling on their own, uh, that was quite a thing for a young woman to be travelling. So what happened was quite a number of them came in pairs uh, from the same school or the same college. They got in touch and said, let's go to Dublin. We'll go to Dublin. We'll go to Dublin. And so so she came and and she stayed. It cost her £1, 14 shillings and sixpence for the night. Uh, She had a bath which was very pleased, I'm sure, she got here. She had her dinner, she had her breakfast, and she uh, left then for the ceremony. She didn't stay a second night. So she was a real steamboater. And this is the letter that she got. The Council of Newnham College desires to let the former students of the college know that the University of Dublin, Trinity College, off- offers degrees to students of Newnham and Girton. The offer is open till 1907. The council does not wish to express any opinion on the advisability of you taking the degree. They merely send the circular to you for information. Now, they're covering themselves. We didn't tell them to go to Dublin, but we think they ought to go to Dublin. All necessary information can be obtained from the Registrar of Trinity College, Dublin. The fees for the BA degree are about £10. And you paid another fee if you wanted an MA now, Trinity was accused of selling degrees, which up to a point it was, because it charged the women quite a amount to have their degree. But they said, we'll only do it for three years, because after that we'll have our own women coming through from the first entry of 1904. So it was quite a controversial thing to do. But what the provost did, Provost Trail, who was a very f- able man indeed, he said, all right, well, we'll, 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 get, we'll have them here for three years, no longer. We'll have the money and we will use the money to build Trinity Hall which will be a residence for women, not in Trinity, because it's a male residence, but out in a suitable distance in Dartry, and the girls can come in and out on the tram. And the first warden of Trinity Hall, Marjorie Cunningham, she was a graduate of Girton College, and she was a steamboat lady herself. And there was a group of women in Oxford particularly who fought very, very hard, and said you should not go. They were very angry about it. They said you should not go to Dublin, because if you go to Dublin, we will never get Oxford to open the degrees for us. We've got to keep on battering here. And by go, if they had to batter. And it's, it's a very long story. Now, Oxford eventually gave women degrees in 1919, after the First World War, and Cambridge really didn't give women full university membership till 1940. They gave them a titular degree in the 1920s and 30s, which was all but a degree, but not quite a degree. It just shows you how important the Trinity degrees were for the Oxford and Cambridge women academics. But they go on to 1907, and actually Oxford and Cambridge would have liked it to have gone on longer. They wrote and said, could we go on a bit longer? It's, it's, it's so important for our women. And Trinity said, no, we're sorry, we're going to stop. I think we're getting a bit embarrassed that so many people come in. Susan showed me a black and white photograph taken in Trinity of a large group, mostly women, formal and proud, standing in their academic gowns and hats. These were a group of steamboat ladies in 1906. Yes, this is one of the photographs which we have of the of the steamboat ladies, these, and this is April 1906. And as you can see, there are a very large number of them. Uh, the provost is here in the in the middle. That's Provost Trail. There's quite a lot there. How many people would have, would have been there? There's uh, there's nearly over a hundred of them. Th- this is what one one realizes: the scale of the thing had become. In the archives that Susan has gathered of the steamboat ladies are personal letters written by some of the women about their trip. Dearest Mother, I never told you about the degree. Giving it was quite exciting, though not a very lengthy process. There must have been at least 90 women. When I got my cap and gown and hood with the white dress, I felt rather grand, and certainly it isn't so fearfully unbecoming. 
And all these women had come to get their degrees, and when they'd got their degrees, they had lunch in the dining hall. Now, no Trinity woman had been in the dining hall before that. It was not done, and women only started to dine on commons in the 1960s in the dining hall. So this is a very rare occasion. They were given a lovely lunch and a speech by the provost and made most welcome, and then they all went back on the boat. This is another description. Do you like this one? Now, this is by Lillian Hay from Somerville. She came from Oxford. The journey is a remarkably pleasant one, and the entrance to the exquisite Bay of Dublin forms a fitting conclusion to it. Let me here advise who goes to Dublin not to leave without a little sightseeing. So she then goes on to say that on arrival, they were looked after by the Lady Registrar, Lucy Gwynne, and escorted from the provost's house after they were entertained to lunch by the provost, who made a short speech. So Lillian recorded, As to the ceremony itself, the arrangements were admirable in all respects. We assembled in the provost's house and went to the college hall, where the BA and MA degrees were conferred. First the honorary and doctor's degrees, and then the BA and the MA degrees. The undergraduates at the back keeping us gay with their wit. It was a lively scene, but not as distinctly Irish as I'd hoped. Oh! Now, isn't that lovely? I thought, yeah, I thought she was expecting... I think she was expecting jigs or something. <laughs> they were also very, very um, pleased, I think, to see how Trinity welcomed the women because they had been very reluctant in letting them in. And they, when the women went in first, they were told they had to trip about and keep quiet and be grateful and wear their gowns and wear their hoods. And they weren't allowed to, to talk, stalk, to talk to men in front square. You know, there was a very much a session in which the women were to fit into a male institution. And here arrive all these fine, upstanding women. Wouldn't you love to meet these people? These very tall and elegant women wearing academicals, <laughs> walking up, the, walking in the front square. <laughs> Lillian Mary Faithful, CBE, 1865 to 1952, headmistress, women's rights advocate, social worker and humanitarian. In 1920, she became Justice of the Peace for Cheltenham, one of the first women magistrates in England. Julia Bell, 1879 to 1979. A pioneer in human genesis. She was awarded a master's degree at Trinity for her work investigating solar parallax at Cambridge Observatory. Julia went on to study medicine at the London School of Medicine for Women and was elected a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in 1938. She went on to do pioneering work in documenting the familial nature of many diseases. At age 82, she wrote an original article on rubella and pregnancy. Lillian Nalds, 1870-1926, an historian. Lillian taught modern economic history at the London School of Economics. In 1904, she became the first full-time teacher of, of the subject at Annie British University. She went on to be professor of economic history at the London School of Economics. Like, imagine that. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, making history. Like. These women did make history, and that is only four of the 700 steamboat ladies who came to Trinity. I asked two recent graduates from Trinity what they knew of the steamboat ladies and if they thought they were still relevant to them as young women. The first woman I asked was Anna Morn, who recently graduated with a degree in history. Tell me, when did you hear about the steamboat ladies? Um, I'm ashamed to say I hadn't heard of them until I was asked if I'd do this. <laughs> but isn't that bizarre that's not known in Trinity? I think that's the case with a lot of women's history, though. I asked Anna to look through the biographies of some of the steamboat ladies and see if there was one that she felt a connection to. She chose Eleanor Rathbone. And I picked her mainly because of her her social work. My dad was a social worker and has always kind of instilled this sense of social justice in me. And I think the minute I saw Eleanor Rathbone's name, this is the woman for me. And she came to Trinity to get a degree for what? What was her degree? Uh, philosophy. She finished in 1896. So she did three years at Oxford in philosophy. So she came from quite a well-known family. Her great-grandfather was involved kind of with the committee in Liverpool for the abolition of the slave trade um, and her father then as well. A lot of the stuff that I read actually said that within their family there was this real sense of 
duty and responsibility that hung over them because their father had instilled this kind of sense of social justice in them. So Eleanor, well, she's basically the reason the UK has family allowances. She passed the Act in 1945, a year before she died suddenly. So in 1929, she was elected to Parliament. She was always politically independent so that no one could kind of tell her to toe the party line so that she could lobby for exactly what she believed in. So she went from women's issues to workers' issues to kind of um, children's issues, child poverty. She, yeah, she was remarkable. Um, And once the 1930s came along, she dedicated herself to what was going on on the continent. And it's been written that she felt a, a kind of a sense of guilt about what was happening in the Sudetenland and asked that Czech refugees were helped. Um, She also sent a ship to um, Spain in uh, 1939 to help the Spanish Republicans in the Civil War there. She was deemed the MP for refugees at one point. So she set up her own voluntary all-parliamentary party group on um, kind of a fight against Nazi terror to try and get as many refugees into, into Britain as she could. A lot of what she did has resonance today and no one no one knew. She was very shy. She wouldn't speak to anyone really, except when she was like really into an issue. And then apparently the junior ministers used to hide in the corridors from her. They'd see her coming and they'd duck behind pillars. Yeah, she was just uh, a force to be reckoned with. The most fascinating thing for me, though, in terms of talking about how she is still relevant today, when she was fighting for children's rights, she wanted to talk about the colonies. Um, one of the things that she spoke about in, in particular is FGM, a female genital mutilation in Kenya. And that was one of her big issues that she wanted to fight against. Given that it only became illegal in 2011 in Kenya, it was incredible. That was in the, ni- in the late 1920s, early 1930s that she advocated for this. So she was well ahead of her time. She sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. I was talking to one of my friends about it. It was the bit where it said that the junior ministers used to hide from her. And I was like, I want to be this woman when I grow up. She is just... And nobody knows about her. They are starting to. And I think that we need to recognise that we are in a much better place. We have far to go, but there were hundreds of thousands of women before us who fought. Who really, really fought for us. And I wouldn't have been able to go to university without women like Eleanor. Yeah, I, I just... The other Trinity graduate I asked was Roisin Parr, who recently graduated with a degree in engineering. She looked to the extensive list of steamboat ladies. I do think that the steamboat ladies are... There's, there's one for everybody in the audience kind of thing. Roisin settled on the mathematician Philippa Fawcett, daughter of leading suffragist Millicent Fawcett, who co-founded Newnham College in Cambridge, and economist and politician Henry Fawcett. I just, when I saw a mathematician, I was just like, this this is the person for me. And she grew up in this amazing political household. She started in 1889 in Cambridge and she studied mathematics. Um, I read this quote that was said that it was the greatest intellectual distinction available to a quarter of the globe's population to study mathematics in Cambridge. Because Cambridge was the best, you know, the British Empire was big and maths was the greatest challenge. Math at the time, like women were actually making really great progress in terms of ranking quite highly in classics and across other subjects in Cambridge. They're ranking fairly equally with their male peers, but mathematics, they just weren't. Maths was considered like the last bastion of like male intellectual ability. And, you know, because women weren't doing too great in it, it was like, oh, see, that's where women are weak in their brain. You know, maths is just not for them. The mathematical tripos was an end of year exam. It was a huge, vast set of exams and they were supposed to be impossible questions. When you sat these exams, the aim at the end of the day was to be called the senior wrangler. To become the senior wrangler would literally set your career alight. So like Isaac Newton, people like that, they were like previous senior wranglers. But at the time, only men were ranked. So women could sit the exam and they were ranked separately. The, the lists, the rankings are read out in this building called the Senate in Cambridge. So everyone was there. 
and they read out the male rankings and I think his surname was Bennett got senior wrangler technically but there was an issue before the exams seeing all these women sit the maths exam the provost of Cambridge he was kind of worried about the women and not because he thought they'd do well he was worried that they would disgrace themselves and about a week before when someone came to him with a concern about the exam results he thought it was because a woman had placed last it was the opposite Philippa Fawcett had gained 13% higher than the senior wrangler. It was extraordinary. It was an extraordinary result from anybody, but from a woman, it was insane. They were like, well, what do we read out in the Senate? And he said, when you call out her name, say above senior wrangler. She could not be senior wrangler. So they read out the male list and there was lots of cheers and happiness and everyone was really excited. And they read out her name. They said, Philippa Fawcett above senior wrangler and the room went nuts and it proceeded to a impromptu banquet for everybody to celebrate her they lit a bonfire on the hockey pitch and she was carried on men's shoulders around the pit around the bonfire three times it it was it was lovely to see that men at the time were just like hell yeah like she did it she beat all of us she's amazing but it wasn't just this huge celebration of her peers it was the fact that kind of the world went a bit nuts over it. There was pieces in the New York Times, there was pieces in London, there was pieces in the Times India. It went all over the world. It was a huge thing. I find this kind of bit a little bit sad. Not that she didn't do well for herself. You know, she she opened secondary schools across London. She worked in the Department of Education. She moved to South Africa. She were, had a reasonable career there. And it would have been a reasonable and extraordinary career for anybody really for any woman in particular at that time but someone said that she was basically denied the academic career a male wrangler would have thought his right her whole story is just insane but her as a person she's really like she's I think part of it was she was politically careful in how she conducted herself and everything she did in her time in Cambridge like People try to write scandalous reports about her. This is before she sat the tripos. People were trying to, because she was Millicent's daughter, you know, people were trying to say, oh, this frivolous woman thinks she can do maths. Even though I'm not like that at all. I am nothing like her in any of the characterization, characterizations I've read of her. I'm nothing like her. But it was still really nice to know that there was someone like her and that she beat them all. One thing I wrote down was that though the words and everything have come from 128 years before, a lot of that is still very like applicable to women today. I think kind of going into engineering, we're all told it's like super hard. And like I was told by people around me like, oh, you're doing engineering. Like that's really tough. Like kind of are you sure you're up to it kind of thing. There is the stereotype that like engineering's for boys and, you know, it's, it's hard work and it's graft and like girls just aren't suited to that. Yeah, that would be kind of where I'd see a lot of similarities. And it just it just really struck me that things haven't diverted hugely in over 125 years. And it is deeply embedded in our culture that uh, girls are not as good at maths as boys. And you still hear people coming out with this saying that this is a fact. It is absolutely and manifestly untrue. Girls and boys are equally good or equally bad at maths. <laughs> this is Professor Jane Gibson, the first female president of the Institute of Engineers of Ireland and the first woman dean of engineering and research in Trinity. We all have a notion in our head of what a suitable career for a girl is uh, versus a boy. And we have an image. Uh, they've done lots of um, studies. Psychologists have done lots of studies and they show pictures of people and they say one of them's a physicist and another's a musician and another's an artist. Pick them up. We all do it. You know, you pick out the male physicist. You never think it was a f- female. And... But I think then the other part of it is like role models which is something we lack because like if you ask me to name a physicist who's female who's very well known I wouldn't be able to name one or an engineer or even a mathematician but I could name a chemist I could name um, a geneticist 
or even Philippa Fawcett like I've definitely heard her name before but I'd never understood like the gravity of her and I think there should be more of a focus on the steamboat ladies because they all achieved such different things and amazing things and it'd just be nice to know that they're there you know so for every female student walking in here that there was pioneering women walking in before them but you're right they were the pioneers can you imagine when they just opened the door to women and there's a handful of women studying there and 700 of them came through the doors in that period Mm. could you imagine what that felt like you were saying you were looking for people to look up to they came en masse yeah. And their gowns. We very few have heard of them. Yeah. Yes, I think I think uh, I think for pioneers, uh, very very important for other people to see the potential. And I, I as a as a as an engineer, um, I would always strongly encourage uh, young women to do engineering. And I I I always felt slightly uncomfortable with the idea of of being a role model. Because uh, that sounds as though you're kind of up on a pedestal somewhere, uh, but I I really do now appreciate the importance of role models because people can imagine themselves in that situation, and that is why it's so important to have role models. But the struggles that the steamboat ladies had was around equality in education, and is that still an issue today? Jane is an outspoken advocate for the advancement of women in engineering and academia. She was the first female vice provost of Trinity and is currently one of the pro-chancellors. From 2015 to 2016, she chaired the Gender Equality Task Force at the National University of Ireland, Galway. For Jane, though Trinity opened its doors to women in 1904, gender equality in education is still an ongoing issue. While women were admitted in 1904, it was, wasn't really until 1968-69 that they got uh, essentially equality. They were not allowed to be made members of Trinity. They were not allowed to be fellows, which is what the uh, college, Trinity College consists of, a provost and fellows. But they were very much kept regarded as being there, but not really recognised academically. For only 50 years ago this year that women were elected open to fellowship. And that was Barbara Wright was one of the Yes. Two. This is Emeritus Professor of French Literature, Barbara Wright, one of the first five women to be appointed fellowship in 1968. Can you remember that day? Can you remember what it felt like? Oh, yes. I very much remember what it felt like. And it was very thrilling for the three the three new fellows of my generation. So for us, it was a great day. For the other two, who were older than we were, um, in the case of Professor Moran, um, who was the first f- female professor appointed to Trinity College, she had, by this point, retired. And the other older fellow was Professor Otway Riven, Professor of Medieval History. She could well have been forgiven for thinking that this was um, an honour which came to her a bit on the late side. Was there a kind of a, a, an anger or a fight to change that? Or was it? did you feel very much part of, that's just the way it is? Well, I was only appointed to a full-time position in Trinity in 1965. So I was young enough not to be in the category of people who were nursing resentments. I'm not too sure that there were too many of those because you've got to understand that although these are now live issues now, they were so much part of the fabric in those days that people didn't question these assumptions in the way that they do now. Barbara entered Trinity in 1952, where she has remained, except for an interlude to do her doctorate in Newnham College, Cambridge. And the progression that you've seen in terms of women here is extraordinary from those early days through. Can you tell me a little bit about that, what it was like? Has a woman been here? We had to be out at six o'clock. There was a book in the uh, Porter's Lodge at Front Gate. And uh, we, if we came in after six, we had to sign in. And there were only two reasons why you would want to come in uh, officially. Um, one would be to attend a meeting of a college society 
or two would be to work into the in the library, which was open until ten. What did I feel? Um, I loved it all. I did even then. Well, resent would be too strong a word. Thought it was a pity that I could not even attend meetings of the College Historical Society or the College Philosophical Society. Uh, these were barred to women. Said so you felt that you grew up in Trinity, that you joined when you were very young. I actually think Trinity might have grown up with you. In other words, it changed the words. <laughs> I think it might have been the other way around. Yes. You have lived your life. Here. Oh, uh, it's I, I've loved every minute of it. Loved every minute of it. But just to finish the link there with Newnham, when I became a fellow in 1968, to mark this occasion, the then principal of Newnham, Dame Ruth Cohen, gave me a gown, one of the steamboat ladies' gowns, to mark this event. And there I had it. It's a plain black gown. It was a gift from Cambridge to me personally. Uh, and I thought that was very moving that they wanted to mark the full accession of women, actually, to all stages in Trinity, in gratitude for what Trinity had done for them. And these were very important women in in society uh, and in the world of learning and it was extremely important that they should be recognised as such. When you wore the Steamboat Ladies gown, did you feel that connection back to the history? Oh yes, you couldn't fail to. You couldn't fail to. And now... We see that women have equal access to education. Yes, but the, the conditions for fulfilling that are not fine-tuned yet. Do you feel, as a young woman, that it's, that it's OK now for you, or do you see that there's still disparities? I know that jobs in academia um, are not necessarily fair, and I know that women struggle to break that glass ceiling. I know we talk about it as a term a lot and I think because we talk about it so much it's kind of lost its meaning but it's a struggle it really is and I think it's important to recognise that just because we've got equal amounts of men and women going to university does not mean that the world is fair, does not mean that academia is fair um, women don't drop out of, of academic careers in, but they progress more slowly than the men and they also, uh, we have far fewer women uh, who make it to full professor. Everybody's become more, more aware of uh, the underrepresentation of women in senior positions and they're looking more carefully about methods of promotion encouraging women to put, their, uh, put themselves forward. So what is it that stops that change from doctorship up? As you said, it's not that they drop out that's not what you're saying. They don't leave academia. They just don't rise up, as it were. There, the reasons are complex and very multifaceted. There is, there is an element of, of unconscious bias, um, and that unconscious bias applies to bo both men and women, and, and the impact is, is that it favours men. There's lots of research that shows that. If you give uh, groups of academics identical CVs, but one has a male name and one has a female name, they will tend to rank the man higher than the woman, even though they're identical. And this is unconscious bias, and we all have it. So we all have to uh, recognise our unconscious bias and sort of challenge ourselves. So that's one thing. The other thing is that the measures by which we assess academic excellence and research excellence are themselves gendered, because uh, for many women, their career is not linear. So they may have time out to have children or they may have other caring responsibilities. So instead of keeping on publishing year by year by year, there may be gaps. If you're looking at the sort of total volume of publications, the quantity of rather than the quality, it can uh, disadvantage women. I don't know, and there is more work to be done, I know that. But, but we need to do real things. And I would say that the thing we need to do most now is to help women 
over the most difficult phase in their career as academics, which is very simply in their 30s when they're trying to bring their research careers to its natural summit and they're also, for biological reasons, wanting to start families. And there are two conflicting elements there and they should be given the maximum help to do that. That would be the way in which I think we should proceed. Well, I remember saying to a certain colleague, a very distinguished physicist, and I said to him, how would your career have worked out if you were asked to lay off for three years in the middle of your 30s? He said, well, it just wouldn't have happened. The solution to, to changing the culture and, and, and ensuring greater equality is not really around, it's not about fixing the women, it's about fixing the system. And when you fix the system and make it more inclusive to uh, accommodate diversity in all its different um, uh, characters, then you make it better for everybody. Like, do you ever go, oh, for God's sake, when is it going to change? Or do you see the change? I do. No, I, I've seen, uh, throughout my career, I've seen significant changes. And in, in, in Trinity, there are, in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a very significant change. Uh, so so I, I definitely see, see change. I, I think society is more of a problem um, because I, I, I still think society is very heavily uh, gendered with heavy, heavy gender-specific roles. Honestly? I cannot believe we are still having this conversation. But we are, and sadly it's necessary. And that's why I think to celebrate the rich diversity of women's achievements, historically and contemporary, is so crucial. Because we need, as Jane says, to challenge our assumptions. And the steamboat ladies do just Mm. that. Just the stand and the pride and walking those doors. You can imagine looking at them going, oh my God, so you can do that and that and that. You'll be a mathematician. But of course, at that that time, uh, most uh, young women wouldn't have been uh, educated to the equivalent of of Leaving Cert in order to be able to enter university. They would have left if they've had primary school education. Well, it was the privileged. I mean, yeah. Oh, it was very much privileged. Yeah. And, that, and that's still, to some extent. <laughs> so over 100 years on from the steamboat ladies, access to third level education is still an issue, a class issue. The socio and economic barriers that are there are still there and they're still quite difficult to overcome. And that's why like, we're reaching out to access programmes to help us build that culture because... This is Michelle O'Kelly, the Mercy Girls Deputy Principal and Career Guidance Counsellor. She herself is originally from St Michael's Estate in Chicor, Dublin 8, and is currently studying for her PhD in Educational Assessment. You know, I don't think we are where we should be. I still don't think there's um, enough diversity in colleges. I still think there's a lot of work to be done. But like, if you look at the the statistics, you know, of of the recent college progression, the average in Dublin 8 for students going to university in 2018 was 37%. Now that's compared to 99% in Dublin 6. But our school has an average uh, university going rate of 68%. So they know we're above the average in the area. So when they leave this school, they are still in an environment a lot of the times where people don't think they're going to go to college. And they're the first in their families to be, in a lot of cases, to be making that transition. Because like people that live in our areas and go to our type of school, they thought, oh, they won't make it, they won't be able to go to college, they won't achieve anything. Like Just because we're women and we live around this area doesn't mean that we can't achieve what we want to. The Seamboat ladies didn't have the opportunities that we have, so why shouldn't we take them? Yeah, it's like yeah. they didn't limit themselves, so like, why should we limit ourselves? So we. I think that kind of convinced us it, as well. Yeah, like, yeah. it kind of sealed the deal for everyone. Like, okay, if yeah, we're, we're definitely we're going, definitely going to the college. See that all the good to me. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of sealed the deal for us. Like, we definitely wanted to go to college. We definitely wanted to go see Oxford, and we didn't want to, you know, not take our opportunities because we have them. It's so like, when you read about like, the steamboat ladies, you went, "These women fought to get the degree," and that it's it's normal for us to go to college because of people like them. They were saying to me that the story of the steamboat ladies inspire them to go to college. Yeah. Is that true? 
I think it's part of their journey. Yes, they most definitely. Um, I suppose they spoke a little bit to you about maybe the College for Every Student program that they began in second year. That program actually opened up their eyes to a whole new world around um, role models and mentors and people that they could look upon for inspiration. And through that process, they did come across the steamboat ladies. Whose story, as the Mercy Girls said, are unknown. And you have to dig a little hard to find them. A story of a group of 700 pioneering women who came to Dublin by steamboat. Women who, over a hundred years later, have the potential to inspire a future generation. Makes you want to see what else lies hidden. But it should be told, so it should inspire other women and young women like us to want to do more. And it did inspire you. Yeah, it inspired us, but I, don't, I think be us. more people should know about it. It shouldn't just be us that inspires, because it has the potential to inspire more women. Steamboat Ladies is a curious broadcast production funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with a television licence fee. Produced and narrated by Patricia Baker. Edit and final mix, Jerry Horn, Context Studio. Music by Jerry Horn.